Hi, Rob D here with Rob B, and this video is the second in our two-parter explaining inflation and deflation. In this video, we're going to be taking your knowledge to the next level and taking a deeper look, starting with something you really need to understand, printing money. Printing more money and sticking it into the economy is so inflationary and it's happening at such a scale that it seems that that should bring about inflation. That force should win out. However, there's something complicating this argument, which is this is not the first time we've seen QE. We had it before. We had it in the aftermath of 2008. And people were saying at the time, oh my goodness, all this money is being created. This is going to produce really high inflation. And yet it didn't. Why? First of all, after the last crash, banks were told that they had to hold more money than before. So because banks were holding more in reserve, that was a deflationary force. So more money was put into the system via QE, but then banks were holding more money back because they were told to, creating a deflationary pressure. So that helped minimize the amount of inflation that occurred. Also, money was being destroyed at the same time. No, it wasn't being set on fire, but defaults were high. People were not paying back those debts. So if the money isn't paid back, then again, that's deflationary. So again, pulling back on the powerful QE force. And finally, another major reason for QE having some inflationary effect, but not a huge one, is that the newly printed money went into assets. So asset prices inflated, but not the consumer inflation. So the way QE was distributed meant that it went into bonds. Bond prices then fell, and then it forced investors to look to other assets to invest in, like property. So QE helped push up property prices, but it didn't push up the prices of a washing machine, your milk, or a TV. So it was selective inflation. So left to its own devices, QE is a very powerful force and could potentially, if overused, cause huge inflation. But because there was enough pulling back on QE, it prevented high inflation. Now, was that masterful economic play by our world leaders and the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve? Maybe. Was it luck? Maybe. But will they get it right again? Could this time be different? It could be different this time because the circumstances surrounding it are different. And let's look at some of those. First of all, there's the raw amount of money being created. In the aftermath of the last financial crisis, there was QE of about £575 billion. There were some in 2009, there were some more in 2012. Totaled, it made £575 billion. In March of 2020, just March 2020, no other time, QE of £645 billion took place. So in a single month, there was more QE than was used to try to get things back on track after the great financial crash. And is that going to be the end of QE? It seems highly unlikely to me. I think it's more likely that that's just the beginning. So even if nothing else, the scale of QE is bigger. And it certainly seems naive to think that you can just pump infinitely more and more money into the economy without it being inflationary. You've also got the fact that money isn't being destroyed at the same time. So like Rob said, after the last crash, you had loans that were being written off and not repaid at all. You also had loans that were being repaid, which actually decreases the amount of money in the system. It's hard to understand without getting into fractional reserve banking, but effectively people repaying loans destroys money. So that was a force that offset the creation of new money. That's not happening this time. At the moment, banks are still lending. Banks are in a much stronger position this time. So rather than the banks being given newly created money and then just hanging on to it, they're more likely to lend it out. Every time they lend it out, they're multiplying that new money. So that 645 billion we've already seen could end up being a whole lot more. Then there's the matter of where that money goes. Again, like Rob said, the way that that money was created and distributed last time, it ended up going into assets. So the majority of the money that was created never actually went anywhere near what you'd call the real economy, as in everyday people earning money and spending it on goods and services. It just went straight into asset prices. So you did have asset price inflation, but you didn't have consumer inflation. This time, there's still some of that going on, but there are different mechanisms at play as well. More of the money that's being created is going into the real economy. In other words, it's gonna end up in the pockets of people like you and me. But essentially, we're seeing loans to businesses that we weren't seeing before. The government is directly paying people's wages in the form of the furlough scheme. So that's money going into individuals' pockets that otherwise wouldn't have been. So this is very different from last time. Before, the new money ended up sitting in banks and going into assets. This time, that's still happening, but more of it is ending up with individuals. But what does it all mean? 
What's the outcome of all this? Well, initially, there will be a lack of inflation because of lower demand. The world is struggling economically right now. So therefore, there are a lot of deflationary pressures in place. And a lot of this money that has been pumped into the system hasn't begun to work its way through yet, but it will. So prediction one is that deflation for all its forces at play will probably not take place. Inflation will be the way forward, but there's a risk here of massive inflation, much higher than the levels that we're used to. And if inflation does get out of control, interest rates will rise to try and control it, which then makes debt harder to service and may be a trigger for the future crash. Now, we're talking years and years away, and what we believe will most likely happen before then is that all this money into the system will create a boom, but it'll be too much money. The boom will be huge, but then interest rates will start to rise, and at some point it'll be the trigger for everything to come tumbling down again. And that marries up against the eating your property cycle quite nicely. We've talked about some of the different forces at play, but that's just scratching the surface. There's so much going on. It's impossible for anyone, including the people in charge of the printing presses, to say what's going to happen. So clearly, this isn't cut and dry. Therefore, it's important that you do listen to both sides and come to your own view of which is most likely to happen. And then incorporate any new information that happens into the future into the framework that you've built because you could so easily be led astray. So while these topics can be big, scary, and sometimes a little intimidating, the fact that you are taking the time to build on your knowledge puts you in such a strong position. Congratulations. And while you're building your knowledge, don't forget to subscribe. We have loads of amazing videos for you to learn from, so don't forget to check them out as well.